Aloha and welcome to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the downtown studios of Think Tech Hawaii and Pioneer Plaza. We focus on success, successful stories of individuals and companies in Hawaii who have overcome the challenges uh, and made it work for them here in Hawaii. There's, uh, we, we keep making these uh, top one, top two, top three rankings uh, for the worst state to do business. And there's some truth to that. The costs out here are very high. But there are companies and individuals that have made it work, and they've done very well. So this, story, this uh, show highlights those success stories. We also have individuals who help small businesses in Hawaii uh, defined as 500 employees or less to be successful with rules, regulations, um, taxes. And one of those people we've got today, uh, Gene Ward, a lot of people know who Gene Ward is. He's a, a member of the House of Representatives here for Hawaii. Uh, been in Hawaii for many, many years and, and has had a very successful career. Gene, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Reg. Uh, I like the backdrop. Uh, we're really downtown Honolulu. I thought we were going to be in Waikiki Beach, but I guess it's good. Well, it's raining in Waikiki, so. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Well, well you're, you've been on the show before. Thank you for coming back again. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show that you've got a very successful career. You've got a lot of accomplishments uh, in your history. Uh, and a lot of people know who you are. They know what you do presently, but they don't always know or appreciate everything that you've done in your career. Can you kind of just, just talk to us a Can little I bit say about who I am and what am I doing here? Yes, who are give you, us some history. Who are you, Gene? Probably the biggest defining moment in my life was when I went to Hilo as a Peace Corps trainee. I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in Borneo and came back to the University of Hawaii to major in Asian studies and everything thereafter, even though I had uh, met my wife, who was Malaysian. Everything became Asian-oriented. Uh, and that was in Hilo? Well, no, I met her at the East-West Center. Ah, it yes. was, I, I, I don't know if you've got time. I've got a two-hour <laughs> soliloquy about this. But it, it essentially became an Asian orientation. My undergraduate is in Asian studies. And my wife is from Malaysia. My daughter is from China. I speak Malay, Indonesian, a uh, <clears throat> bit of Chinese. Vietnamese. But, and, and I was a Vietnamese uh, translator in, in Vietnam. But I guess, in, in related more to your, your, uh, your show, is that I was the Small Business Administration Advocate of the Year a couple of decades ago. In fact, it was National Advocate. Not wow. an advocate, advocate for the Year for Hawaii. And then I went to Washington, and I was the advocate for the country. Because George Conahaley and I, some people will remember Dr. George Conahaley, we founded the Hawaii Entrepreneurship Training and Development Institute and trained 3,000 people throughout the world. We had 10 different countries. Started here with Hawaiians, did Kamehameha schools, went to, uh, uh, to Guam to do Chamorro training, to New Zealand to do uh, Maoris, and then Africa and And you even had a book on it, didn't you? Wasn't there a book uh, that was used? We, we, in fact, were still putting the website together to, to keep it alive, even though because I've been in politics, I haven't been doing the consulting as much as I should. But with, with the, the text, how to start a business, how to run a business, how to write a business plan, mm -hmm. how to borrow money, how to work with a CPA like yourself, uh, entrepreneurship is, I guess, the next biggest influence I ever had. My wife and I did 15 years at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel selling clothing. And I was her marketing guy, paid the bills, and Wash the windows and wipe the floor. Typical the floor. entrepreneurial yeah. activities. You've got to be able to be the <laughs> bottle washer to the uh, yeah. every everything. But to me, the salvation of uh, our economy is small business. So I, I I guess I come out of that Asian orientation and then out of the small business uh, orientation as kind of in a I guess in a nutshell. Right, and one of the themes that we uh, encourage here in, is to understand how important the small business community is to our local economy. I think it's uh, you know 97% of the businesses in Hawaii are defined as small business. Using the SBA 500 mm -hmm. and uh, below, but if you use, I think the Chamber of Commerce sometimes says 20, in, 20 employees and below, there's probably 75%. Still a large 
part of the economy. Yeah, and, and, but we are just really a lot of small businesses. You remember in the old days, there used to be a, the big five, yeah. Alexander and Baldwin and uh, all the other guys, and they're no longer uh, the guys that uh, we can count on. There's no big five. No, well, they're fragmenting Except the big out, five Republicans in the legislature, there's only five of us. Oh. I know you don't <laughs> want to get to that yet, but I call us the big five. All right, well, very good. And you all seem to sit together, too, so. Yeah. In the telephone booth. The, um, I was just going to say, you know, it's a nightmare thought, but if using the 20 and 75 percent, mm. if, if they ever got sick, it would have devastating results in the economy. I mean, think about it. 75 percent of all the business in Hawaii all of a sudden goes away. You know, that's a scary thought, and it's very important that we help that small business thrive and be healthy and, and help them to survive. Most definitely. Even though there's a considerable resiliency in the small business community, they generally are looked upon not with the, the economic engine that they are. The new 70 percent of all new jobs come out of the small business community. They have a difficulty getting capital, the regulation. And quite frankly, in the legislature, we give like lip service to farmers, we give lip service to small business. We haven't really been pro-small business. We're I think ranked number five mm -hmm. of the la the bottom five in the bottom nation five, yeah. as a quote business friendly environment in the state of Hawaii. We should we have the most entrepreneurial ethnic groups in the world right here, right within the vicinity of where we're doing this show, but yet we kind of we don't promote it. We don't we're, we're sort of underachieving, if you will, mm -hmm. our entrepreneurial potential. Hawaii's got the best brand name that exists in the world. And we should be taking more advantage of that. And we haven't. Yeah, it's, it's too bad. Well, and we can talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do that tends to embarrass us a little bit. We, we had a chance to touch on that. But before we get too far, um, you've also done you know, some pretty interesting uh, international positions uh, with mm. the, the government. I mean, you were involved in some countries that, uh, well, that were interesting. My overseas uh, experience began in the Peace Corps in Borneo, where the orangutans are and all of the other good things. But then when I was a young man, I always look, I would look at the globe and I'd say, how could there be so many countries? I've got to go there to prove that they're there. So I've been in 63 countries and I'm wow. still willing and wanting to go to more. Uh, my wife and I uh, joined the UN in, uh, in the 80s, went to Malawi and did uh, small business development there. And recently after, as, as you know, as most other people know, I ran against uh, then Congressman Abercrombie in 1998, lost, but went off to Washington and worked at USAID under President Bush as an appointee. But then one of my colleagues at USAID said, hey, Peace Corps is looking for country directors. I said, well, I was at the bottom of the group. What do, What's it like to be a country? So I applied and I became the country director in a place where most people don't even know or heard of, East Timor. So I was there uh, just about 10 years ago and as the country director, had 46 great volunteers, people who loved America and they wanted to give back. That's kind of a tradition that I think we're losing a bit in the last few years. I'm out of the old John Kennedy. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. It's not corny, it's real, because right now, the mindset on the street is, hey, what if you got government for me? What can I get out of you? Exactly. That, they, that, they that want, spirit is they're flipped entitled. They, they got their hands out. They the want entitlement something. and other things. And I, I know that maybe at some point we can talk about uh, those issues. But anyways, overseas well, is, is East, a big issue. East Timor. Yes. <clears throat> um, interesting environment that triggered your departure. Uh, interesting environment. The poorest country in Southeast Asia, 400 years of uh, po colonial uh, uh, Portugal suppression and then 25 years of military uh, operations by the Indonesians. But in terms of what was going to happen and how the, let's say, and, and I would even apply this to Hawaii, you can unite a country, you can unite the islands, but if you don't unite the people, you haven't got a country yet. And what was going on in East Timor is the, the military was jockeying with the power structure within it with sometimes factions and some ethnic and some other regional stuff. So there was an insurrection. So the ambassador said, okay, all unessential American personnel leave. Mm -hmm. I thought our volunteers were essential. 
but they said, no, where are you going to go? And it will, we'll come back. But Reg, after they evacuated us, it took 10 years to get Peace Corps yeah. back into a place which needed it so, 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 so badly. As I said, the poorest country, but maternal, maternal death when the East Timorese would give birth was the highest in the world mm -hmm. in terms of death rate. Well, we're going to have to take a short break here okay. in, in a minute, and we're going to come back and talk about some of these other issues. But the reason why I, w I wanted to just touch on that is that there's some similarities, I think, to what you went through and what I went through during the evacuation of Saigon. Uh, it was fragmented. Oh, oh, we oh, pulled oh. out in 75, and it was a very terrifying and very sad experience, uh, almost embarrassing. Did I interview you about that? that? Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> do that sometime. Okay. All right. But this is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, we're here today with Gene Ward talking a little bit about his background in history, which is very colorful and interesting. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the upcoming special session and some other things that Gene's going to be working on uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, we'll be right back after one minute. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Tim Apacha, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Thank you. Aloha, and welcome back to Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. Uh, this week we're talking with Gene Ward, who shared some very interesting details of his background and experience. Always impressive to hear that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the special session that's coming up and some other issues that uh, we're going to be addressing here in the next year or so. Gene, um, I know we're switching gears a little bit here, but um, I guess we've got a special session coming up here pretty soon. Is it special? I would say we're going to go back into session. Whether it's special depends on where you are on the rail, and I'm not sure that I would call it special, but it's it's an extraordinary addition yeah, to what we've done 60 As a layman, every session is special. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on to your wallet. Yeah, exactly. Sam Sloan would say. So we've got, uh, I guess that's the single purpose of the session that's going to be coming up. Is My understanding is there will not be any overrides of any of the vetoes that the governor has put forth. There will be no new legislation, only whether, and this is where the tug of war is, is it going to be an extension of the general excise tax, mm -hmm. or will it be an increase in the excise tax, or will it be a combination of the TAT and the general excise, because I doubt it's going to be a full-on TAT, the travel, uh, sorry, the uh, transient accommodation, or the hotel room tax. So you think the property tax issue is off the table? Uh, to me, that would be an anathema. If we went into session and the result was that the property taxes went up for the people of Oahu, that would, they should throw all of us out. The only thing we got going tax-wise in Hawaii are property taxes. I, I, I don't call it a sacred cow, but it's one thing that, my God, give people a break. We in the legislature have not cut the cost of living for decades. In fact, if anybody's cut the cost of living, it's when they brought in Costco, they brought in Walmart, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. brought in Target, like my daughter <laughs> would like to say. That's how we've cut down the cost of living. Otherwise, we, the people of Hawaii are hurting and to raise their property taxes, the landlords. And you know, you know what the median household income, I mean, the household uh, cost or the median value of a house now is 775000 it's huge. It's huge. And I've heard that in the next five years or so, it could go up over a million. That's what is projected by some of the economists. So those at the lower rung are going to be hit by a general excise tax because it's very regressive. The poor pay more, to put it in very simple terms. Well, and that's what makes that solution somewhat unfair. But also, you could build a similar case for TAT because then all of a sudden, you know, unless you restrict it to just Oahu, the, the neighbor islands, if they have to pay TAT, yeah. then, you know, that's... It would be a sucking sound for the whole of tourism. Exactly. But the, the, the attractive part of that is that the tourists are going to pay it. But then the, the, the tension is 
the goose that lays the golden egg is the video industry. Yep. And if we keep pushing the envelope to where we're going to be the price of New York and all those people who come, our family, they're not business travelers like they get in New York. We're going to push ourselves out of the business. And it's very competitive. It, and it's getting more competitive. There's a lot of markets out there that are seeing this golden egg and would like to have a piece of it. And so they're getting pretty aggressive. So we have to be careful. My, my, my sense is, and I'm, I'm not going to be voting in any of the TAT or the, uh, the general excise tax uh, increase, is where, and you know Hong Kong by your own experience, Japan and Hong Kong gets the private sector to, to divvy mm -hmm, up because mm -hmm. they get development rights. You want to build a shopping center, you want to build underground uh, uh, areas for, for uh, retail, you got it. You want to build a hotel, you want to build workforce housing. We have not got any private money into this at all, and I'm very saddened by that. We have not leveraged what we could leverage in that 20-mile stretch of the, quote, mm -hmm. transit-oriented development corridor. Do you see any possibility for a private-public venture? I've talked to Mr. Murphy about this. He said, well, we are going to get some of the stations. Maybe the stations will have some vending or some mm. part of it. I would hope there would be some creative entrepreneurial using, again, small business as a way of showing up. And like the, the rent that the small businesses pay at the airport, basically fund the airport. It's almost self-funding by the, the amount of percentages that the, the vendors are getting. So we could be creative, we could be more entrepreneurial, but the way it is now, and, and, and Reg, we haven't even talked about the operational costs, the electricity mm -hmm. and all of the things that are probably gonna run two or 300 million a year. And that'll go on forever. And that, yeah, exactly, it's, it's in perpetuity. So we have a real difficulty. I think there should be a discussion that uh, Cliff Slater and uh, Ben Caetano and uh, Randy Roth and Sam Sloan will put forth. Run those buses back and forth. You could do it rapidly, more cheaply, Get them off at the station, just like it is with the uh, uh, with the, with the automated rail cars. There's a number of options, but we got locked in early, and we got ourselves committed to where, if you're swimming across the river and you're halfway there, if you go all the way or you come back, you've got the same amount of energy. And right now they say, well, you can't tear it down. Well, we can use a different technology to use it because steel on steel is 100 years old. Well, it was old when we initially selected in, it. In, <laughs> and if there was ever a prescience about the vote that was very close, mm -hmm. if people knew, I mean, nobody believed Slater when he said, oh, it's going to cost three or four times the amount. Nobody believed that. If there was a vote now, it would surely go down, and I'm sure they were going to vo avoid any vote like the plague yeah. to do that. So anyways, that's, quote, the special session. It's basically something where there's going to be a... An understanding of this is a state project or is it a county project? Is it the city and county? Well, I know that the Finance Committee and Mayor Caldwell have been at loggerheads about the veracity, the truthness, and how if we're going to pay for something, give us a price tag, not a moving target of how much it's going to cost or how we're going to do it. It's probably one of the, and you're, you're the expert business consultant, probably one of the worst kind of business plans that, that people make up, like the back of an envelope in a bar well, it's got no they credibility. They, they, so far, from what I've been watching, they have not been accurate in any one of their projections yet. So they're 100% inaccurate. That's the way I've been reading it. So where's the credibility? Who are you going to believe and how are you going to believe? Because when you, you know, if they went to the bank to do this, the bank, they, okay, when you know what you're going to do, come back and see me. When the, you know how much it's going to cost, give me your cash flow statement. Give me all these operational costs. They can't do it. It's loosey-goosey, and somehow government allows that to happen. And I'm hoping there will be where there's going to be some skin in the game, some monitoring, and some accountability. Otherwise, as I said earlier, we're just taking the poor of Hawaii and making them poor. You know, the accountability, the transparency issue, I mean, didn't they just have an opportunity to have a little bit of a, a financial audit done, and they turned it down? They said there's yes. no need for it. That would have cleared their name, and that would have made them a bit more credible. Why would you not want an audit? Why do you plead the Fifth Amendment when you know you're feeling guilty? The audit, unless it was going to be so costly they couldn't afford it, which was, which was not the case, they should have had it in order to mm -hmm. clear their name. Mm -hmm. I'm confident Mr. Murphy is, if anybody is going to turn this thing around in an open and a frank way, he can do it. 
as so long as he's allowed to. If and not bowing to the political pressure of other forces in the. Yeah. Well, good luck to him, and and good luck to us as a state that we can figure out a solution. You to know, this. the rule of thumb is unless you got three million people in the vicinity or the corridor to do a rail, you have not even reached square one to say, yes, we're going to do a mass transit. Well, and that's why this is going to be a drain on the economy for a very long time. There's only one good thing that, that's there, and it's the gem of we, we, some, we have an identity crisis as to who we are and how we're going to develop. Sometimes we think we're Los Angeles. We're just going to sprawl all over, which we do. Look at what's going on in uh, Ho'opili. Or sometimes we think we're Hong Kong. We're just going to go up. We kind of go between back and forth. The one good thing about the rail is there's got to be one way to develop to the second city, and that's going to be along the corridor. If we did that well or had plans, right now, Reg, there's not even there's not even the infrastructure to put mm -hmm. in some of the things I said if they had the rights to build a hotel. There's not the infrastructure to do it. Well, and that's where the costs just keep multiplying. Because they say, well, we forgot about this. Then exactly. Then it's where, again, if you don't do it, you wasted the money that you've already put yep. in. It's, it's going to be an interesting 10 or 20 years to see how yep. this all plays out. We meet out. the end of August till the 1st of September, so you'll be following this blow by blow. Well, hold on to our wallets. Yes, that's the... You know, we've got, uh, we've well. got about three or four minutes left, and I just wanted to touch a little bit about another hat that you wear. Uh, as and I never the, wear a hat, according to my wife. But, uh, it, <clears throat> yes, well, she reminds me I should always wear a hat, but I don't. Well, yeah, you, at least you still got hair. <laughs> um, but what I'm getting at is your role with the Republican Party at a national level. You're a national uh, appointee. National committee man. Actually, it's not an appointee. It's a, an elected position. I ran for the position in May of 2016. And it's one of three positions that each state has, national committee man, national committee woman, and the state party chair. Throw in the... American Samoa, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and uh, the territories, and you've got, a, I think, 169 people who basically run the Republican Party. And I find it's, it's, it's really uh, invigorating to go to the RNC meetings and see so many red states. <laughs> it's kind of like a vicarious, like, wow. The values and the attitudes that we have in Hawaii, even though there's a minority of us here, the values and attitudes of us here is what's, in effect, the governing model there. So we should take heart. Even though we're temporarily a blue state, the values and attitudes of America are being run out of the mainland. So I'm very, very encouraged by that. Well, and you just had a conference call or a meeting? White House conference call last week. One of the guest uh, attendees in the conference call was Karen Handel. If people remember Georgia 6 of the 6th Congressional District of Georgia, broke all-time records. It's almost embarrassing as, as, a, as a political person to say that that race cost $60 million. Six zero? Six zero. No joke. Was, 50 had been reported, but she said on the, on the uh, phone call that there are new expenses coming in, and it looks like it's going to go up to $60 wow. million. And that was, quote, the test case as to whether Bush could, uh, Bush, Trump could be pushed over or the ushering in of a new era anti-Trump was going to happen. So everybody and their uncle threw money into that, uh, particularly the Democrats had huge amounts of money, more so than the Republicans. But Karen Handel was a former Secretary of State, God-fearing woman, conservative, and it was just a great encouragement to hear from her vis-a-vis -vis what was going on in the White House. And they talked about and Cuba and other Pardon me for asking, but is this, was this a U.S. House or U.S. Senate seat? U.S. House seat. A House yeah, seat. Yeah, Georgia 6. It is seat. 60 Newt, million dollars. Newt Gingrich's old seat. Six, you know, Jen, I ran for Congress once. To get into the congressional race, you've got to have at least a million or a million and a half. Abercrombie spent a million and a half. I spent 500,000. So for openers, you've got to have at least a million. To win, the average is 1.55 million, I think, in all the states. So when you jack it up to 60 million, it's You're amazing. pouring everything, including the kitchen sink, into that. That is not good for money in politics. It's huge. It is. It, Too it's, much. It, it is, and it makes it s to the point where normal people who would like to run it's for like, office hey, I'm out don't of even want to try. Yeah. It's like it's out of the out of the league, out of the fashion. Uh, a race in Hawaii is thirty-five 
to probably 50,000 a year. So it's, it's doable in, in the sense you can raise that amount of money in a, in a few years. But we have uh, always had these public funding bills come forward, but we can't mm -hmm. afford it. We have not been able to do that, and I don't think taxpayers, taxpayers want to fund right. uh, political elections otherwise. Very interesting, but also a little sad, too, to, to hear that it's gotten to that point. But it's a good indication of things to come. I guess it was a bellwether in a sense that she, she won the position. There's mm. other states that are going to be in a similar type of uh, election cycle that's going to be coming up, I think, next year. And so there could be more opportunity for more GOP uh, representation in the House and the, the Senate. The GOP has got to deliver. It has the White House, it has a majority in the uh, state houses. It's got the Congress, the Senate. We have to deliver. And I think the people are ready for that change. But, you know, as Churchill said, it's, it's a messy, democracy is a messy thing, but it's it the is. best thing mm -hmm. we got going. It's like a sausage uh, factory. Messy, but it tastes good when it gets done. Democracy is self-correcting, so all this stuff that's going on about the Trump and all the other things, you know, it'll settle down. America is going through a lot of these trials. You know, as a Vietnam veteran, when we came home, when you came home, oh, yeah. if it wasn't spit, it was a vitriol about who you were as a man who served your country. Yep. So we'll get through this, but it's, it's a little bit uh, I just hope we can keep right it now. civil. We need to, to bring some civil uh, discourse. Speaker Say and I just wrote a piece for Civil Beat on the need for civility in politics, either oh. in Hawaii or in the mainland. Perfect timing for that. I wish we had time to go into that, but we've run out of time today, believe hey, it or not. we just got started. Yeah. Yeah. We, we could spend another half hour on this. Yeah. Um, but we'll have you come back and we'll talk some more. Uh, this is Reg Baker, Business in Hawaii. Uh, we broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. Uh, and we highlight uh, individuals and businesses that have made uh, an impact uh, on the business community here in Hawaii. Uh, until next week, aloha. We'll see you soon.